Hi everyone, uh, it's Alex here from Panoramic Associates, joined today by Mark Bajant. Uh, Mark, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Mark Bajant. I'm the Corporate Director for Regeneration and Culture in Redbridge Council in London. Brilliant. Uh, and then, for people who don't know, can you just um, talk about the role that you currently do at the moment, um, service areas, etc.? Yeah, so I'm one of five corporate directors across the council and uh, regeneration and culture is the, the title, but it covers a lot more than, than that. So um, I manage the planning service, all of the corporate property provision. I manage corporate capital delivery, which includes housing delivery, schools, community centres, etc. And um, I've got responsibility for regeneration in terms of town centre renewal, and um, all kinds of work with businesses and employment and skills and then on top of all of that I've got the um, delivery of libraries, leisure centres, parks which we deliver through a charity called Vision which is an independent organisation that spun out of the council about 15 years ago. Amazing, I don't think as many areas you don't uh, <laughs> don't look at is it? what keeps your, keeps your uh, day busy. Why the public sector? Like, I, I know the reasons why people give me good feedback from it, but of course there is different polls from private, public, private. Yeah, what, from your view, why, why, why do you work in the area that you do? I mean, I've worked my whole career in the public sector and I guess it started very much rooted around working with homeless people. So I started out working uh, as a frontline housing officer, helping people who were mm. facing homelessness, preventing eviction, getting people into temporary accommodation. And then as I work my way through different roles, like working with um, council tenants through tenant participation, developing strategies, developing investment strategies, particularly the whole Decent Homes programme. All of that, to me, is about improving people's quality of life, improving their life chances. And um, having come through housing as a career path, I mean, housing is fundamental to everything, I think. Uh, if you mm. haven't got a secure and stable home, then um, it impacts on your children's education, it impacts on your health, it impacts on your sense of safety in terms of local crime and community safety. All of those different things I could go on and on, but all of that as a picture is, that's what the public sector is here for, to build a strong uh, place, a strong community, and um, a base for people to live their lives and, and uh, you know thrive and succeed. Um, in our society. So very much rooted in all of that ethos around public service. With local authority, um, there's always budget pressures, but unfortunately, not unfortunately, but it is mandatory that we do provide housing for everyone. So we, we discussed offline about particular ways how to overcome overcome that. Yeah, can you, can you talk through the initiatives that Redbridge are doing at the moment? Yeah, I mean, we've been... Uh, We've been one of those councils that's um, got into building council housing again uh, after years and years of not doing it. Um, the challenge for Redbridge is that our existing council housing portfolio is very small. So we've got just over 4,000, 4,500 properties. Mm. And um, the ability to borrow against that base in order to build new ones uh, is quite limited. So we've built something like, um, well, we, we are building something like 500, 600 new council homes. And um, that's, you know, that's a big increase in the number of homes that we manage. But we can't keep that going indefinitely because we just can't borrow the money. The, the, the rules around borrowing in the housing revenue account for the council mean that we, we will just hit a ceiling very soon. Um, and we've got other pressures. We need to uh, deal with building safety, fire safety, um, the whole zero carbon agenda, which we might talk about further later. Um, all of that is is needing capital investment as well. So we're now looking, we've got quite a lot of sites identified, some small, some medium, a couple of larger ones. We're looking at how can we innovatively work to continue building new housing, but where we don't have to finance it, we don't have to put in the capital up front. Um, and there's a range of options. So one of the options is simply to sell the land to a developer. Um, now, that's not the best way to secure what we want in terms of affordable housing, but it can work, particularly if we work with a housing association, a registered provider, or we have a development agreement with a, a developer which secures 
the, the numbers that we want to achieve, the mix we want to achieve. So that's something we're starting to explore on some of our sites. Um, we're also looking at the option of a leasing scheme where we, we keep hold of the long term uh, freehold in the land. We lease the land to a developer. They build it out. Uh, it's funded through institutional finance. We then um, pay the lease. Essentially, we're paying all the rents over to the institutional funder over, say, 30, 40 years. And at the end of that time, we then own the property that's been built. So it comes back in as council housing at the end. That's a model we haven't we haven't secured a, a scheme like that yet, but we're starting to look at that very seriously, both where we own the land and also other privately uh, owned land where where private developers haven't progressed a development. And we think this could unlock those stalled schemes. Um, the last thing to mention, which is really for the very small sites, is we're really interested in talking to people who might want to do community led building of smaller sites. So community land trusts um, are doing this uh, in a number of places. We're having that conversation. We're, we're really keen to do that where it might be, you know, five, 10, 15 homes being built. And um, that could be done through a cooperative or a community land trust. And that could be for sale or for rent, but it would certainly be at an, an affordable level. So it would be secured in perpetuity as affordable housing. Um, again, that would that would be something that um, we would want to promote um, with, you know, with a range of different partners. So we're very open to people approaching us and having that conversation. You heard it here. Please, uh, please get in touch with Mark if you've got any uh, potential offerings based based on that. And um, for me, yeah. I'd be keen to understand from your knowledge what your initiatives are. Can this be translated to other areas across the country? Because London has different challenges, different demographics. The list could go on to maybe someone down in the southwest and northwest. From your knowledge, could people adopt this approach to their the house building programs? I think so, and I think it's already happening. Um, I mean, the, the idea of a development agreement or a disposal of land to a housing association is not a new idea. I think um, 20 years ago, a lot of councils, that was all they were able to do because there wasn't any funding for councils to build themselves. Then that funding started coming through, those op opportunities started coming through. It became much more uh, what councils wanted to do. Uh, and some of them will continue doing that because they've got the capacity, but but there are definitely councils who need a more um, mixed approach. They'll do some stuff themselves, they'll do some stuff with partners. Um, I think from my point of view, um, it's about looking at the risk profile of each scheme. It's about looking at um, you know where your priorities are and, and what the opportunities are. Some schemes, they're perfect for 100% council housing. Some schemes you actually want a mix and you want to have some private rented housing. So you want to get in a build to rent um, provider to do that maybe. Or you, or you think it's a, a perfect site for some market sale housing. Now, some councils will take the risk of building market sale housing themselves, but um, you know some councils have had problems where they've taken on too much risk, and then they haven't got the money back, and they haven't you know managed to get the sales through to, to cover all their costs. So, again, you know that's that's a situation where you're better off working with an established market sale provider, a developer who knows what they're doing. And um, you know you can still benefit from a share of the profit at the result of that market sales strategy. From these ideas you just outlined, what do you reckon would be a driving force for skill set in the market that you might that maybe maybe Redbridge or other areas of the country be looking to looking to acquire? Yeah, I mean I think critical to this approach is having people who uh, understand the procurement rules around development agreements and joint venture agreements and that kind of thing. Um, so you, you definitely need procurement expertise. You need people who are good at uh, building those relationships, marketing and uh, exploring those options. So um, it's very outward focused. You know, pe people who are doing council housing delivery, pure and simple, can be quite inward focused. They just do what they do. They they run a development program within the council. 
um, they're not necessarily looking at those relationships with other providers. So this is very much about people who can build those strategic relationships, those partnerships. So it's partnership working, procurement understanding. Um, and I think um, the, the last part of it really is, is that flexibility of approach. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I've said that really. You, you want people who are able to work with a whole range of different partners. Perfect. Um, so as we touched upon earlier, we always like to understand what other areas that viewers would like to, like to um, hear from next. Then we touched upon the zero carbon. Yeah, can you expand a bit more what you'd like to hear from maybe someone who's listening uh, on the next episode? Yeah, I think for me, the big challenge for the social rented sector around zero carbon is in really simple terms that the the investment that goes in from the landlord doesn't pay back to the landlord because if we can't increase rents to reflect the improvement, then um, the, the tenants, it's great that they're getting a more energy efficient home, they're getting the savings on utility bills, um, you know, whatever aspect of, of that, that that you've invested in, whether it's insulation, you know, generation of of energy through solar, solar panels, etc. Um, all, all of that adds up to an equation where there's money going in, investment money going in, and the, the payback doesn't come through the rental stream. So how do you make that work? Is it reliant on government grants? Is there some other way of um, working in the long term to get that revenue coming back? That's something I, I know people are working on. It's a challenge. I'd be really interested to hear from anyone who's cracked it. Mm. Yeah, it seems so simple going from A to B, but there's so much in the middle there that we need need to address because for uh, to satisfy different parties. But um, no, yeah, I'll make sure to yeah. If anyone's watching, please, please get in touch. Cheers, Mark. Thanks for yeah, really, really, really good insights around that. Hopefully, there's a lot of takeaways for people listening. Uh, and yeah, hopefully, speak to you soon. Thanks very much. Pleasure.